Good evening everyone. My name is Sonia and I am the Alumni Engagement Advisor for the Faculty of Engineering. On behalf of the Faculty of Engineering and the Alumni and Student Engagement team, I would like to welcome you to the Alumni Engagement LinkedIn uh, workshop for 2019. Firstly, I would start by acknowledging and paying respects to the traditional owners and elders, both past and present and emerging, of the land on which we stand, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. So just some housekeeping. Toilets are just um, outside to your left. Um, there is some food still left, so feel free to grab some. Um, there is a professional photography ph photographer, Chris, who's just in the foyer, so if you haven't had a professional photography um, shot yet, feel free to grab some after the session. I would now like to introduce Sue Elson, who is our presenter for this evening. Sue was born in Adelaide and moved to Melbourne in 1994. She joined LinkedIn in December 20, 2003 and is, and is one of the first 80,000 people in the world, um, 80,000 people in the world on the platform. She has been consulting on the topic of LinkedIn since 2008 and learnt, launched her first three 80,000 word books in 2016. She has a background in banking, training, recruitment, HR, marketing, employment, websites, and social media. And her first website, newcomers.network.com, went online in 2001. She created CampbellwellNetwork.com in 2012 and 100 Ways Publishing in 2014. She's currently an independent LinkedIn specialist and career development practitioner, providing consulting and training on the topics of LinkedIn, social media, and marketing to individual clients and organizations worldwide. She also provides a variety of LinkedIn and career advice services for local and international companies, teaches at two educational facilities and provides business consulting services to private clients internationally. I welcome Sue to share with us her expertise on how to get the most out of LinkedIn. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, this is the second event for Monash Engineering Alumni that I've done. And as it's a workshop, it's designed to be interactive. So it's not a lecture where I just stand here and tell you what to do. So please feel free to interrupt me at any time. I'm extremely well known for written notes. So you, I hope you've all got a copy of those. You're welcome to open up your desktop, laptop, computers, uh, laptop, I suppose, um, and use you know, desktops, anybody hiding one in their bag? No. Um, I, I always say desktop or laptop because the platform works differently on a desktop or laptop than it does on the mobile phone, so that's where that comes from. But anyway, um, the handouts are here. I'm sure Sonia will be happy to send you a digital copy as well so that you don't have to sit there and type out all the links. You can just click on them and reuse them. Because we've only got an hour together and there's so many things I could tell you, um, I just wanted to be able to focus on the most important and then whatever's most important to you, you can follow up with afterwards. Um, I did a presentation earlier today to the early career researchers at Monash University at Caulfield campus and I just wanted to put into context the importance of having a LinkedIn profile. And what I started off by doing was, and Sonia can prove that I've never touched this computer before, so this is not some sort of magic trick um, that I'm doing. is just my name. Now you can be quite sure, um, I believe the three best ways to get a job is through networking, referrals and voluntary work. So if that happens, somebody's going to know your name, they're going to Google you. Even at a party, what's your name? Oh yes, I'm going to sneak out of the bathroom and decide whether I'm going to keep talking to you or not. So um, what comes up is obviously my exact match domain name website and then secondly my LinkedIn profile. But it actually took me six months to get that website above LinkedIn in search results. On the right hand side I've got my Google My Business account and I've asked hundreds and hundreds of people to write me reviews and I've managed to get 64 so I get very excited when I get a review and further down on the right you'll also see I've got a little carousel of posts because I'm posting every seven days. So that means that if somebody is looking on their mobile phone I get all that extra screen real estate at the same time 
And then obviously, even if you click page 10 of Google search results, my name is still in, in actual results on Google. So I've got a huge amount of content online. Obviously, Google doesn't index all of it, it only goes to the bit there. But um, there's a lot of stuff on there. Now, the next thing that I want to be known for is being a LinkedIn specialist. So this, I had a very recent asked him to Google LinkedIn Specialist Australia and I'm number one page one in Canada even for this search query. So if you want to be found for your area of specialty, you can use LinkedIn to help you be found. So there's my LinkedIn profile on the first page of search results. In fact, somebody obviously knows that people are Googling it and paid for an ad. Headshot.com.au. That's, no, it's not profile booth out the front. Yeah, so somebody obviously thinks they're going to and then my website comes up second, and another lady who refers to me and has pinched the same words on the title of her website page is number three. So, um, you know, this helps me get work, and obviously, if you're a specialist in your particular area of engineering, then you can come up for your keywords. Obviously, you would also want to come up for the name of your business, so I've got various ones, but if we just put in 120 ways for publishing, then obviously my website comes up, it's indexed, I've got my business location on the side, and then I've got other listings where I am online also appearing in search results. So you want all of these things to happen, and if you're just a new business and you create a company profile on LinkedIn, that will often come up on the first page of Google search results as well. So these are all reasons to have a, a really good LinkedIn profile. What you'll also find is that if somebody Googles your name, and you're a consultant like me, if you type space, you can see people know me for LinkedIn, Newcomers Network, and they also want to check out my reviews. So that's another query. So if we go with that query, we can see that I've got a page on my website called Reviews, and I've also obviously got my Google reviews showing. So no matter what people Google about me, I've got my content coming up uh, before something else happens. So. Um, I've been doing a lot of workshops for different groups recently, so the very next link on this handout is what you can put on Google for free. So if you have a Gmail email address, you already have a Google account. So although you come here for a LinkedIn workshop, I am really going to encourage you to also create a Google profile because that will help you appear in Google search results. And what you may also like to think about is I believe that everybody really needs to have their own website, yourname.com. And so you can start off with something really basic. So I'll show you my orders. This is literally a one page website with a picture I took at Envelope in Victoria and links to her social media. So what this means is that if somebody Googles you, your LinkedIn profile is going to come up and your own website is going to come up. So um, you can then obviously link to anything that's relevant for that. Also, if you've already got your own website, there's a um, discussion there on what you should do before you upgrade it, because a lot of people make a lot of mistakes when they upgrade their website. So <coughs> that link in there as well. Now, a lot of you probably are not necessarily thinking about putting a lot of content online but it is absolutely vital if people are looking for you to have the details of your content online and also for you to engage in social media. So whether you work for a business or you have your own enterprise, what Google wants to see is a business website and activity on social media. So if you don't have the both, then you're not going to get results. So those next few articles to talk to you about getting started by just engaging with content curating content where you get other people's stuff and share it through social or you create content so it gives you some tips on that and then the next one is how to make your LinkedIn post go viral and the next one is about how to write articles on LinkedIn and get them search engine optimized
tell me why they think this post managed to attract 32,000 views? Because it just went in the normal news feed. Any ideas? Don't be afraid, I don't mind. That's not it, have the word China in there. China? <laughs> That's an interesting one. Nobody's ever said that before, but yeah, it could be. It yeah. has photos. Has photos. And what is particular about those photos? Yes, so they're different, but they're the same. But they're also of a face. So people are naturally drawn to faces. And I don't know about you, but whenever I saw one of those puzzles, spot the difference, I could not help myself but try and find the difference between those two images. And what our brain automatically does is it tries to match what about this do I already know and I can attach to. So a lot of people are drawn because what the social media platforms do is they measure how long people scroll past content. So even if you don't like, comment or share it, if you've scrolled really slowly because you're looking at that jolly two pictures trying to work out what's going on, then they see that as people like that content and therefore they'll share it and make it go more viral. So I haven't got any external links in here, so I'm not linking off to another article I wrote. So I'm keeping people on the platform. I've notified LinkedIn about it. I type in at LinkedIn. And I've also put a few hashtags on there, which are subjects. So if somebody clicks on those links, then they'll find other content on those subjects. And then I've also got quite a few <coughs> comments. So 64 comments. And every one of those comments I've replied to. So because I replied to it, it gets another round. And I also got quite a lot of likes as well. So that's a way to create a post that can go viral. If you, if you think about the elements there, then your content can potentially go a lot further and be shared more widely. I also mentioned on page three there, the concept of an engagement ratio. So if you think LinkedIn is here, I'm gonna say, everybody give me a job, everybody give me a job, you know, every week. People are gonna get very sick of that very quickly. But also the platform will say, you're always talking, but you're not listening or engaging. So when you're on these social media platforms, it's important that you interact with other people's content as well. So don't like everything from Sue Elson because you might not really like it. You need to check it out first. But you know, if it's something tied in with your subjects and interests, you can definitely do that. But for me, the reason I've lasted in the online world is I have content that appears in the newsfeed and I have a lot of content that stays on the internet. It's there forever. So that helps me to continually come up with <coughs> search results. So for those of you who don't know, LinkedIn was started in 2002, launched on the 5th of May 2003, over 610 million members now, in over 200 countries, over 10 million in Australia, four and a half million, I'm oh sorry, that's no, over five million now, active monthly users, that was from last year, but it's gone up a bit. And their mission is to connect the world's professionals to make them more productive and successful. So they make money out of lots of different channels. So please do not feel bad if you use the free account. I'm still on the free account. So you don't have to pay for premium. And there's no point paying for premium unless you do the changes that I suggest to you tonight. Um, they've started off as a network and they've moved on to publishing and their next incarnation they tell us we as a business to business platform. So you'll actually have to do business within the platform. And up to 75% of hiring managers will Google you before an interview and 95% before they hire you. And because up to 85% of jobs are never advertised, because if they advertise it, they've got to write the ad, get approval for the ad, post the ad, field 300 applicants, you know, who wants to do all that work in a busy business? So if they can just find someone on LinkedIn, recruiter or HR professional, then much, much easier to do that. And a lot of business is still done by referral as well, so keep that in mind. So, as a result of doing so many presentations, people tell me their concerns about LinkedIn. And some of them are things like, well, there's no privacy, you know, where um, I don't want to tell everybody everything about me. And I said, well, you get to choose what to tell people. If there's long gaps on your resume, you need to explain those because otherwise people think we're in jail, on drugs, you know, some terrible things happen to you. Um, and you obviously need to have a digital footprint. 
So there's some people now who won't get work because when somebody Googles them, nothing comes up. And that's a problem because people think, well, you know, I've got no online profile. In fact, I saw a really funny video on Facebook and this girl met this guy and uh, she said, oh, you know, can I follow you on Instagram? Oh, I don't have Instagram. Are you on Facebook? No. And so she met with all her friends and they were all very concerned. They couldn't find out anything about this new guy because he wasn't on social media. And they were very anxious about it. So, you know, it's even in the dating world that a lot of people feel suspicious if they can't find content online. If you don't know who to connect to, that really depends on your purpose. So one of the academics today was saying, there's some academics who connect with every Tom, Dick and Harry anywhere in the world, and then there's other academics who are very selective. So you need to sort of make choices. Do you want to be selective or do you want to open up the world? Because I run networks, I say pretty much yes to anyone in Australia, unless they're multi-level marketing, then I say no way. Um, and the only others are good quality international people. They have to have a minimum number of connections, reasonable amount of detail, you know, have, have other criteria for accepting too much time, well I suggest you do a cost benefit analysis. I, would, I, I use it obviously quite a lot, but for the average person I'd say no more than 20 minutes a week. Um, you know, that's if you are actively looking for work or opportunities. Um, I still use the free account. Can't write. A lot of people fear what to write online. And what you've got to remember is most of the time you're talking to a computer. You're not talking to a person. So you've got to think what does the computer need to find in my profile for me to appear in search results? So you've always got to keep those words in mind rather than I started my career in blah, 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 blah. You know, you don't need to say all that flowery stuff. You can just focus on who is someone. Scared of computers? Well, sorry folks, they're here to stay and you've got to be digitally competent, which means you've got a LinkedIn profile but um, you've also gone to the next stage and you put videos and you've filled in all the boxes and you've got nice photographs and so on and so forth. So that obviously makes it look a lot better. And you may have to follow social media guidelines and if you need help, you need to ask a friend or expert. So, um, page five, we, I've given you some links there. If you're not sure about what you'd like to do next in your career, you can definitely read that article on how to choose your next job and once you've chosen your job you'll need to come up with the keywords that you want to be found for so you can't say on LinkedIn seeking opportunities like nobody is going to be looking for seeking <coughs> opportunities they're going to be looking for an engineer or you know project manager or something not seeking opportunities <coughs> ban that word so that article helps you work out what your keywords would be and then I talk about the benefits of LinkedIn so a lot of people think of it only as an online resume and I've only got to update it when I need a job. But you need a network. You know, your success in life will depend on a network, not just on jobs. And you also need to think about it as a way to have your information details found, how to find other people that you might want to interact with and, you know, do research. There's, there's heaps of other benefits um, to being on LinkedIn. And by the way, I don't work for LinkedIn. I've not got shares in LinkedIn, you know, there's no other agenda here for me to, to push LinkedIn for you, just for your purpose. Um, if you need to convince someone else, you can check out the business case and some reasons why. So, would anyone in the room like to share a good news story about LinkedIn that they've had? It's always interesting when you get a news story from someone else. Can you think of something that's exciting that's happened on LinkedIn? If you haven't, what I'm going to suggest, uh, if you haven't already, I'm going to encourage you to put the LinkedIn app on your mobile phone because at the end of tonight, I'm going to help you network with everyone in the room. So there's free Wi-Fi here, so if you turn on Wi-Fi and if you've got the LinkedIn app on your phone and you've signed in, you're all good to go. But if not, you can do that now and I'll show you a, a cool little thing at the end. So um, the next part is the LinkedIn profile updating cheat sheet. So I've now written an article on LinkedIn. So that if you want to go through this at any time, I'll update that article and it'll be there. But before you start updating your LinkedIn profile, I suggest you start collecting some stats. So if you've got your laptop open, you can collect these stats right now and write them on your, on your handout. First one is your number of connections. So if you 
click on my network and say your number. And I've got 16,290 something up there. So you write that number down. You can have a maximum of 30,000 and you can have unlimited number of followers, but that's the maximum number of connections you can have. So I suggest if you've just got a brand new LinkedIn profile, you want to have at least 60 people you're connected to, and over time get that to more than 500, so nobody knows exactly how many connections you've got. The next one is your number of followers. So click on your face, and you've been active recently. Just here under your dashboard, it will tell you your number of followers. So I've got over 17,000 followers. So if your number of followers is higher than your number of connections, that's like saying you're a thought leader because those people are not connected to me, but they're still interested in my content. So if you want to be known as a thought leader, you would try and make sure that your number of followers is, is always increasing. The next one to find out, well, people are looking at you is this one. So I've had 1,055 people look at me in the last 90 days. Now, I doubt whether any of you would have that kind of number because you're not me and doing what I do, but if you were actively looking for work or business opportunities, you'd want that number to be over 100. If it's less than 100, it's not really working for you. And if you click on that, you'll be able to see on the free account the last five people who looked at you. So. Uh, there's four people anonymously and one person who's been corresponding with me earlier today. So I call that reverse stalking and I love doing it because that tells me who's actually looking at my content and if it's people from workshops I've been in or clients, I get super excited. So if you decide to keep looking at my profile, I'll be super happy about that. Don't feel as if you have to look at me anonymously. Borrow as many ideas as you like. The next number to look at is the number of times you have used search results. And this is over the last seven days. So these two numbers need to be reasonably similar, the first one and the, and the third one. And the reason they need to be similar is just because you've appeared in search results doesn't mean someone's going to say click and go there. It doesn't guarantee anything. So if you had a really low number of search appearances and a really high number of profile views, it probably means you're on the front page of the newspaper or you're super popular. Um, likewise, if you've got a lot of appearances in search results, it means that your content is being found by people, which can lead to more opportunities for you. So keeping an eye on those numbers can be also in this dashboard box on the top right hand side, you can see that I'm an all-star profile. That basically just means I've filled in most of the boxes. I, like I haven't filled in patents because I don't have a patent, but you know, I've done in lots of boxes. And further down, I've got skills. People have voted for them. So my top three skills I've chosen to list up the top are LinkedIn, LinkedIn training and writing. So I've got more than 20 votes for each of those. So whatever your top skills are, if you can get at least 20 votes for those. And again, this is a real time <coughs> stat, so you can't go back and compare it. And then you can also see that I've both given and received a similar number of recommendations. So if you've sort of received 100 recommendations and given zero, what does that tell you? <laughs> not, not a good look. So um, I encourage you to keep the number both received and given fairly similar. You might like to write recommendations for your lecturers, your colleagues, um, strategic companies you'd like to work for if you've had some interaction with them. But please remember that anything you write in a recommendation can be used in court. So please be careful about what you say because, you know, say you're working with a project manager and you say they're fantastic, but they were terrible to work with, but they got everything done on time and on budget. So that's what you should be saying. They got things done on time and on budget. You don't say they're automatically a fantastic project manager. But some people will find that person's behaviour perhaps uncomfortable. So there are your stats. The next thing you can do is back up your profile. 
So the first one is if you change your setting on Chrome, anybody's profile so not just your own but anybody else's as well so if you like the look of somebody else's LinkedIn profile and you'd like to borrow a few ideas you can download theirs so you just click more you can choose save PDF now what you'll see in your notes so we're now in the middle of page six is I recommend that you call something quite distinct so 2019 I'm 06 for June 06 for the 6th of June today and then your name with dashes in the middle and then the word LinkedIn and profile and then you save it wherever you'd like on your computer. That way you know that on the 6th of June that's what your LinkedIn profile looked like before you made any changes. After you've made any changes you again save the PDF and have a new copy of it. And as I said before you can do that on anybody else's profile and print it out, borrow some ideas, whatever you like. The next one is on the me menu, under settings, privacy, come on, and down here it says download your data, and you choose the works, and you request it, and you pop your password in, which is done. Now what that does is it helps LinkedIn prepare all the content you've got on your LinkedIn profile and they send you an email with a link. You click on that link and you download the files. Now that will include a list of all the people you're connected to. Their first name, their last name, their current job, their current company and the date you've connected. So if you're working for an employer, you might like to do that list before you start and then you leave see which people you got that you acquire through your job or that you need to add to the company database before you leave. Um, but yeah, really good to have as a backup. LinkedIn will delete your profile if you're naughty and you go against their LinkedIn user agreement. And we also need to remember that we can't rely on technology. So if something went and, you know, some hackers got into LinkedIn, you want some sort of record of your account so that, you know, it could be reinstated. Um, after the disaster if it occurs. Okay, so any questions to that point? Yep. Can you upload from that PDF file back up uh, into your no. profile? You can't, you no. can't, at least you've got it. At least you've got a copy, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, how valuable are like connections on uh, LinkedIn? Like, what can you add? Well, heaps of things. Um, look, I work on the principle that it's always good to try and connect with people who've met me. And then if they see my content periodically in the future and they think it could be helpful to them, <coughs> because I'm publishing every so often, they'll remember that I still exist and therefore they might contact me for that purpose. But also, do you remember everybody you went to school with? You know, none of us remember all these things. So by having them all in one spot, if we think, oh, who was that person, you know, they're an alumni of my school, you know, you can try and find them and you can try and reconnect or, you know, there is that, that benefit. <coughs> you can approach people to be a mentor or an accountability partner. You can publish your content. You know, there's lots of reasons for having it there. But I think the main thing is to connect with people and then maintain that relationship. Because in the old days, if you met someone and you didn't keep in touch with them three times a year, they disappear as somebody who remembers you. Whereas with this sort of thing, you can connect with them. And like I had one client come to me and he, apparently he met me eight years ago. But then when he decided he wanted LinkedIn, he came back to me. But because we connected on LinkedIn, he remembered <coughs> I still existed. So therefore, you know, he came back at that point. So yeah, you, you can, find uh, people in other locations, you know, say you've got a, a conference, um, you can connect with the speakers or, you know, something like that before you get there and ask them questions. I mean, you know, loads of things that you can do and reach out to people. When I was on a committee for the Australian HR Institute, 
we used to have to get guest speakers to come along and speak at our workshops and so I'd find guest speakers on there and, and you know, reach out to them. So there, there's heaps of different things. Mm. Just to add on that question, yeah. um, the group you get from connection to some kinds of random people add you and you don't really know yes. that. So in the early days of LinkedIn, they used to have this little algorithm that would plot on the map how you were connected to all these people. Unfortunately, I confused the algorithm. They couldn't produce a map because it was just too many people from too many disparate areas. So if you said to me, look, I'm a civil engineer and I only want to connect with other civil engineers and that's it, well, that's all well and good if you only ever want to live in the civil engineering world. But the reality is, most of us have multiple dimensions. We're not just a civil engineer. We might play tennis, we might have other hobbies, you know, there might be other aspects to our lives. So for us to keep our network alive and to feel supported in multiple ways, where can we keep this, you know, connection going? And I think LinkedIn is a very good place to do that because it's not necessarily someone you want to have as a friend on Facebook, you know. It's more of a professional type of relationship that you would have. So you need to make a decision as to who you say yes to and who you say no to. But because I run networks, as I said, unless they're going to be a real pain in the neck, I'm going to say most likely say yes. Um, but if I perceive that they're just a search engine optimization company from Bangladesh, <coughs> cross, you know, they can follow me and see my content, but I don't want them getting into my network and reaching out to people and annoying them, etc. Now the benefit of having more connections is you're more likely to appear in more search results. So if you and I are connected, and you're a civil engineer, and somebody I know is looking for a civil engineer, then you're more likely to appear in search results because you were a civil engineer. So, you know, that's that's another benefit to being connected. Mm -hmm. Yep? Um, so the, is there like a separate algorithm for calculations in less than 500? reality is none of us know how the algorithm works for sure, oh, okay. right? Because why would they tell us that? They're not going to necessarily, like Google doesn't tell us how their algorithms <coughs> work. So I work on the principle, if you're authentic in everything that you do and you just keep showing up, mm -hmm. then you will appear in search results. But if you just disappear for months at a time, never log in, don't update your profile, don't add any new connections, why would you appear in search results? Now, when we were in recruitment, we would only ever keep job applicants for three months because we would assume that if it was a good quality candidate within three months, they'd be somewhere else and we couldn't consider them for the recruitment process. So if, if you like to think about it, an algorithm being multiple variables, not a silver bullet. So whilst 500 connections could be one good thing, it's only one good thing. If you had a terrible photograph, you know, when people spend up to 60% of their time looking at the photograph, you, you could have 500 connections and nobody like you just because it's a terrible photograph. So you know, I, I don't believe in silver bullets. I believe in a really good quality, consistent, authentic approach across multiple levels. So, um, this is one setting you absolutely must change if you haven't done it already. <coughs> Go to your LinkedIn profile, and on the top right hand side, it will say, edit from your profile and URL. So, when you look at my LinkedIn URL before, you would have seen it was just slash Sue Elson, and that means I've changed it. Now, if you have got the automatic one that LinkedIn gave you, it will be your first name, dash, last name, dash, and a whole bunch of numbers. And that's fine, but it does not optimise your name in Google search results. And it looks terrible on resumes and business cards and email signatures. So if possible, click that pen over here on the right and see if you can get your first name and last name as one word as your LinkedIn URL. If that's not available, you can try putting a dash between your first and last name. And if that's not available, just put your first name, last name, and a number at the end. But please, nothing to do with your date of birth. I'm an ex-banker, 
things. I don't like anything to do with dates of birth if you don't have to put it on something. And that, regardless of what you do, that will optimise your name in Google search results. So it will help you appear if somebody Googles your name. Also, if you go crazy one day and run naked down Burke Street, the journalist might be looking for you online, so you might need to hide your profile. So please do not delete it, just turn it invisible. So for some people who are in special professions like psychologists or psychiatrists or lawyers or emergency services personnel, they can't actually have a public profile, but they could still have a LinkedIn profile and just turn it to invisible. And then further down on this page, you can make your profile photo public and you can also let Google, um, LinkedIn know which parts you want visible in the public domain. And I obviously suggest have them all turned on. So that's the first one. That's If you learn nothing else from tonight, please change your URL. That's really, really important. So the next thing is your photograph. And Monash has been super cool tonight by giving you the opportunity to have a beautiful professional photograph. I had some feedback on the new photo I put on my profile saying it didn't do me justice. So I found this other photo with my book that I do like. So I would normally only have a head and shoulders shot, but because my book is an important part of my story at the moment, I've decided to have it so that it's in the shot. And as you can see, it makes it very difficult to see my face. So ordinarily, what I would suggest is zooming in. And putting my eyes on the one third line and having it like that. But because there's all that distraction stuff in the background, it doesn't look very good. So I'm still going to get another photo done in due course. But for now, because the book's just been released, I like the full story one. So that's why I put that photo there. But as a general rule, you would have head and shoulders. Now you would also have a high neck garment so that it frames your face and doesn't have people looking down. And um, you'd also make sure there's no distractions and things in the background. So that, that nice white background that, that Chris works with does really, really well. is this background picture. So what LinkedIn does is it gives you this revolting blue background with lines and circles. I absolutely hate it because it distracts the eye and makes you go in all sorts of ridiculous directions. So for a lot of my clients, either for women I say a white background and for men the LinkedIn blue and it, what it does is it drags the eye to look at the face which is what you want to do. Now, as your engineers, you could also have an engineering picture in the background, but what's going to happen then is people are going to look at the engineering picture rather than at you. And so obviously the goal is to get people looking at you. So I still prefer a plain one. Now, again, I'll show you my daughter's profile. And this is an alternative to just the standard one. there is I've chosen a colour that's the same as her garment so it ties in and looks a little bit unique but without it still makes your eye focus on her face okay so that's the goal of the picture because this is about you and you know she's looking at the camera smiling with her teeth <coughs> shining etc they're, they're all important things and believe it or not up to 60% of the time will be spent looking at that photograph so please don't you know go like this in your photo it just doesn't look good um, you really need to be smiling. Um, there's also some tips for your photo there and if you want to assess it you can upload it to photofeeler.com and people can assess your picture for your likability, <coughs> your influence and your competence. So I've decided I want to be competent and likeable, I don't want to be influential. You know, I'm not a politician, that's not my main objective. So my image is designed to be in that competent and friendly. which is just under my name here. So when I was Sue Everything, I didn't get any work because nobody knew, well, you know, Sue does, um, yeah, uh, well, she does, um, and nobody could remember what I did. So then I thought about it and thought, 
where can I add the best value out of all of my skills? And I decided it was as being a LinkedIn specialist. And I've called myself independent because I don't work for LinkedIn, because I don't want people to think that I work for LinkedIn. And then I've used all the other words that I would like to be found for afterwards. And then I've also added something that makes me memorable, because I like writing poetry, and I like dancing, and I've put in a little emoji. So if you're using your laptop, you can just go to the website getemoji.com and you can copy and paste an emoji off of there. Now, I, I do that for a couple of reasons. First of all, I'm over a certain age, so I don't want people to think I'm dead because, you know, for some stupid reason, you go over 45 and people think, you know, your history. So I've got the dancing to sort of indicate that I'm active and alive, but also it makes me memorable. And I've only used one emoji because if I put like five emojis in there, I'd look like a 20 year old and that doesn't look good. So, you know, I've only got one emoji. So some really good emojis are things like aeroplanes or oh, good evening. <laughs> um, so yeah, you, you can pick an emoji that you like. So one of the people I was working with this afternoon, he, he's a rock climber. I thought that's gonna look really cool as a little emoji on, on LinkedIn. And the exciting thing is that if you noticed in the Google search, that little emoji appears there. So it looks, it attracts the eye because it's something, you know, a little bit different. Um, if you update your headline on your desktop or laptop, you get 120 characters to play with. So don't put a slash between words because that joins two words together and you don't rank for either word. So you'll see I've just got a space. I don't even have commas. If you update your headline, headline on an iPhone, you get 210 characters. So you get even more characters that you can be found for. Now in this box, talking about algorithms, the headline is the number one spot for your keywords. If you want to be known as an engineer and you haven't put it in, in that box, forget being found for engineer. It is the number one spot for your keywords. The number two spot is your current job, and if you're not currently working, you can say looking for engineering roles and make that your, your current job. And then any previous jobs, and then it's the content in your summary or your experience sections, or your education subjects, or your um, recommended skills, you know, so it's in all those other areas. But the number one spot is the headline, and the number two spot is your current job. So if you don't have that word in those two categories, it's going to be very hard for you to be found. Now what you'll also notice is my mission when people look at my LinkedIn profile is to, if they've probably heard about me, so obviously they're going to want to contact me, so I give them my email address and my phone number, and on an Android device that will be clickable. But then what I've also done is I've linked to my services page. So that says, this is what I'm here for. So my purpose is very, very clear. So if you're looking for work, you could put your details in and say, interested in roles in, blah, 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 and just tell people straight up, you know, that's what you're after. If you don't want to make it really, really obvious, you say, um, uh, you, you talk about your professional skills. So then what will happen is, if I'm a recruiter, and I'm looking at it and I see, hmm, they've got their phone number and their email address and they've told me what their skills are. I think they want to call, you know, like it's pretty obvious that you're open to offers just from this screen. And I'll show you another feature in a minute. So then if the person bothers to click here and see show more, I've written my content with really short dot points because it's much easier to read short dot points on a phone or on a bigger screen and it helps people interpret it. And then I put in my little bio because I do a lot of speaking and then I've added in my book videos and a picture of my books. I'm not going to update that, but they'll know. Um, and so on. So, you know, obviously filling in that summary is important. If you would like some tips on how to write a LinkedIn profile summary for your purpose, there's the link in the notes as well on page seven. Any questions on that bit? Okay, so I'll show you a couple more settings. Oh, one question. Yep. Well, I remember the swipe symbol yes. is, is uh, valuable in that big one, but you're saying it's not. Well, what I don't like about a pipe 
type symbol is you have to put a space before and a space after. So you lose three characters. So if you just had a space, it would just be one character. So it doesn't give an advantage of the search Not to my knowledge, but I can't verify for certain. The other issue I have with a pipe is it takes the eye up. So it's much harder to read text which has pipes separating it than it is just to read a sentence. So that's the other reason why I don't put them in. But yeah, look, if you've just got three things and that's it and you want to separate them with a pipe, pipes are good on titles of websites because it helps the search algorithm determine it's two different topics on, on, the, head, on the title of the page. So I know it works there, but would it work in the headline of a field on LinkedIn? Uh, I wouldn't want to predict that. It could, but I, I can't guarantee it. Mm. Was it a tech person who told you that? Uh, I wouldn't say he's overly technical, but he's, he's certainly been trying to uh, mm. work on his uh, LinkedIn quite a lot. Yeah. Okay. Look, you know, the more important thing is to sort of tune in to the minds of <coughs> who's looking for you and put those words in. You know, that's the most important and put the words that are most important at the beginning because the, the closer they are at the beginning, the more important that is. Like if I put dancing at the top, goodness knows what sort of jobs I'll be offered. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously it's at the end, yeah. Just a quick one. Is there a reason why you prefer writing in third person than in first person? Excellent question and observation. Okay, so there's various schools of thought on this and ultimately you need to make the decision. Right? So when I'm reading about you, but it says I, because it's about you, it's your profile, who am I thinking about? Thinking about me, aren't I? Because I'm reading I, but it's about you. So that's one reason. The second reason is for me, a lot of people say, I did this, and then I did that, and I, 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 and after a while I'm thinking, who the heck does this guy think he is? You know, so I get very jaded by the whole I, I, I. But then there's another school of thought that says, look, it's much more personal. You know, I started my career and I went there and then I did this. And it's much more conversational and <coughs> friendly. So there's that aspect. But I am positioning myself as a specialist. So when you read my profile, it's Sue does this and Sue does that. So that reminds you that Sue is the person you're reading about. And it also <coughs> presents me in a I suppose, a more professional capacity. So that's another reason I like using it. But again, I still wouldn't say Sue, 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 you know, 600 times either, because it, again, it looks like I'm just brain. Yeah, but you get to choose. Of course, there's a third option, which is no person. Started uh, working as a such and such, moved on to blah, did this, did that, something, something else. And so there's no person. There's no reference to you, me, or anybody else. Um, so that's another option as well. Well, it's your choice of emoji too, right? So one person I know, she says she's a foodie, so she put a slice of pizza on. Now, unfortunately, when I see a slice of pizza, I think of somebody who eats pizza and drinks Coke and is probably stuck to a computer, you know? So it's not really a good picture choice for me. But, you know, if it's just an aeroplane and they say they like travel, well, sort of, you know, there's heaps of people that like travel and it just looks like you're up to date with the times. So I have discovered that when you post, if you put emojis in a post, it will also perform better. So I think there's this trend for the platforms to acknowledge emojis as somebody who's a bit more up to date. 
than somebody who's not got an emoji. Can I prove it? No, but I have noticed a difference when I do include them. Yeah. But I'm selecting about what I choose. Like one accountant, I was working on his, his um, resume and he said one of his interests was playing poker. Hmm. How would you feel hiring an accountant who likes playing poker? <laughs> uh, suggested he should take that one off of his resume. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm, now, what does your profile photo look like? mobile phone number and email address is all over the internet but because right next to it I say I've got services they don't call me because they don't want it like I get spam I've had spam for years so you know I've just got a good junk mail filter so I don't worry about that but you need to make a choice as to what's more important to you if you're in active job search mode you don't want there to be any barrier to somebody reaching out to you and if they have to click contact info and it doesn't show and blah, 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 they'll just, oh, next, you know, move on to the next person. But if you're not in active job search mode, you can take it off. If you've got your own website and there's a contact form on there, you could link to your website, you know, so you've got choices. So obviously, if you were the CEO of Telstra, you would not put your email address on LinkedIn because, you know, you're going to have every disgruntled shareholder and unhappy customer, you know, after you. So then again, you would put a link to the contact form for Telstra, you know, so, so you, you choose all of this. But I'm a consultant and my goal is to get aligned X. So I've told them very quickly what I do. So that eliminates a lot of, oh, hello, Sue, I saw you on LinkedIn. I'm just wondering, you know, can I just talk to you for half an hour for no fee? No, yeah, no, I, I don't have time. So that's why I put it up there. So, but it's a great question. Um, and the geek who I was working with today said, I'm not putting my email address up because I don't want spam. I just consider it a fact of life. So, yeah. So, um, if Absolutely, you could. So you would add all of your other email addresses to your LinkedIn account anyway, because you don't want to accidentally end up with a duplicate LinkedIn account. And then you would add that, that particular work email through as well. And what you could do is while you're actively searching for work, you could set up a redirect to your normal email address. And then when you're not actively searching, you could just turn it off and let it, let it go its own way. Yeah. Uh, that particular box is plain text, so unless you can work out a way to put an image in there and... Or say part of the banner at the top. Oh yeah, okay, yeah, no, that, that's an idea. Um, look, I find that if people go to a screen and they see what they want and they try to click on it and it doesn't work, it pisses them off. So, you know, I like to make things work. I like the user experience to be really good. So that's why you'll see, I always write it as plus six, one, four, zero, you know, and I always do that with the spaces, and so it's all familiar, and you know, I'm very, very consistent in my approach for that. So again, yeah, great idea, but you, you've got to think about people who are lazy, and people are click resistant, and then they get annoyed that they've got to type in the numbers. You know, people are just, we've got impatient. You know, goldfish can concentrate for eight seconds, and we can only concentrate for seven, apparently. So, you know, we're worse than goldfish now. Hmm. It depends on your phone. So an Android will see it as a phone number. Sometimes the iPhone does if it's in the app, but not on the browser, I think. Yeah, so it, it, it varies. But look, even if it isn't a clickable link on a phone or a screen, um, the person can still select it and then, you know, copy paste. So that, that helps if it's in that right format. But if it was a 04 and it's somebody from New Zealand trying to reach you, it's not going to work, you know. So that's why I always put it in that international format. Yeah. 
algorithm won't see the words in the image right so the other thing you'll notice is I've got the picture of my books to the right of that banner and that's because when my profile is looked at on a mobile device my face slides into the middle so I've also made sure that it looks okay on both the mobile device and the, and the laptop yeah uh, can you sandbox that kind of thing publishing? So when you're fiddling, sandbox when you're fiddling with your profile yeah you have to publish that every time, you have to check that it's... So if you do it in the first day, you can Yeah, look, you know, 6,000 people are not looking at me every moment, so I don't worry about that, yeah. But if, what I will do, and this is important, if I've worked for hours on somebody's headline and I've asked them 64 questions and they've changed their mind, you know, 94 times, and then I click save and it goes... It's like... So, if I've worked really, really hard on something, I will always copy it before I hit the save button because the platform is temperamental and spits the dummy on a regular basis. So, if it's something really important, I really encourage you to copy it and put it in a little email to yourself and have a backup so that if it goes, you can just copy paste it. Yeah. Cool. Anyone else? No? Okay. All right. So, Now, I've got heaps of email addresses, and I've added them all to my account. So if any of you still got your Monash email addresses, put those in there. Any work email addresses you've ever had, please add them all to your account. Because if somebody did allow their LinkedIn to sync with their phone or their email, your details could be in that person's device, and then it will try and add you to their network. But if you don't have the email address on your profile, then they won't be able to find you. So it's always a good idea to add all of your email addresses into your account. And also, if you end up in a, a high level security position, please do not use your work email address as your primary email address. Because apparently foreign intelligence services will target you trying to get, you know, secret information out of you. So just put your personal email as your primary one. Further down on this screen, you can add your phone number. And if you add it in here, LinkedIn will constantly hound you and ask to go through your phone. So if you are diligent and can not click yes when you get that request, you'll be fine. But I have a lovely young client in her 30s who's been on lots of first dates and she put all their phone numbers in her phone. So she accidentally synced her phone with her LinkedIn account and all those first dates were invited to connect with her on LinkedIn, which was terribly embarrassing. So if you add your phone number in this spot, you have to be willing to ignore that <coughs> syncing SYNC process. Also on here, you can turn off autoplay videos. So if you're on your mobile device a lot, you don't want your videos to be running all the time and to use up a whole lot of data. So you can make it that you only play the videos when you actually press play. And if you've got duplicate accounts, this is also where you can merge them. So in the privacy section, if you're in the job search mode, you would definitely say anyone on LinkedIn can see your email address by clicking on the contact info. So this is not in the summary section, this is in the contact info section. So obviously, I say everyone on LinkedIn can see it. And I also let everybody know who I'm connected to. And this one, viewers of this profile are also viewed. I can only write this one. Oops. That should be set to no. Because what happens is, if I am looking at your profile, your LinkedIn profile on a mobile phone, and I get to the end, and it'll say, People who looked at you also looked at all these other people. And then they'll say, oh, I like the look of that person. They're off. All right, so you want to turn this one off. Unless it's late at night and you want to do your espionage and you say, right, who else am I competing against? 
you turn it on and you can see all the other people similar to you, the people are looking at. But for the most part, you should definitely turn that one to no. Now, down here is your stalking option. So, I have mine turned on, so if I look at someone's LinkedIn profile, they'll know that I've looked at them. And that's a good thing because there's a 30% chance they'll then look back at me and maybe they'll hire me for something else, I don't know. But if you want to look at somebody, say you've got a job interview tomorrow and you don't want that person to know that you've looked at their LinkedIn profile, you can make yourself anonymous and you can go and look at them and they'll never know you looked at them. And then you can come back in here and turn yourself back on. Now, even if they have a premium account, they will still not know that you looked at them. So that's definitely anonymous. Um, so I don't like to do it unless I'm doing it on behalf of a client and then I'll look anonymously because it's got nothing to do with me that I'm looking at that person's profile. So it's just confusing. But as a general rule, I always leave myself turned on. I'm happy for people to know that I've looked at them, even if they're my competitor because, you know, they look at me, I look at them, it's just, you know, being authentic, really. Mm. Yeah. It's usually because they've got some great content out and I'm uninterested, so yeah. I don't have an issue. Some people use it as a marketing strategy, particularly if they're very introverted. So apparently there was this person who kept looking at the boss's LinkedIn profile over and over, and then the boss kept seeing this person keep turning up. So one day he said, do you want a job in? Yes, thanks. <laughs> it was all because he kept looking at this, this boss's profile. Yeah. <coughs> There's other things, but yeah, they're not as important. So I won't worry about those tonight. So back to your profile. Websites. So I'm absolutely going to encourage you to put websites in there. So if you work for an employer, you can put their website in. If you're a member of a professional association like Engineers Australia, you can put your link to Engineers Australia. You can put a link to your own website. If you've got an amazing Instagram account because you're a part-time photographer, you could link to that, you know. But please, put three websites in. And don't choose personal or company when you add them in, you always need to choose other. And because you choose other, you then get 30 characters to describe that link. So it looks much more professional than just saying it was the company website. So you can put in your own little description. And that helps you come up in search results. So as a result of me putting in my find a practitioner page, that now appears on the first page of Google search results. So Google obviously comes in and looks at these links and says, well, Sue says that's Sue, so therefore we'll put those links in Google search results as well. So I've, I've noticed that. You can also, again, put your mobile phone number in here. You can put an address in. It could be your workplace. You can add Twitter handles, blah, 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 instant messaging, so on and so forth. I missed the reference to the final Oh, so in the website section. So because I'm a professional member of the Career Development Association of Australia, they give me a profile page on their website. So what I've done is I've got the link for that profile page and I've put it in here. So that if people want to verify that I am a genuine career development practitioner, they can click that link and see that. Mm. Yeah, but if you're a member of Engineers Australia or something or other else, you know, put that in. Because the platform will say, they say they're an engineer and they're linking to engineering information, therefore they must be an engineer. You know, so it's just continually telling the story uh, about what's there. Yeah. Sorry, the other doesn't show up? Did you choose other on the top right? So when you chose contact info and then you chose the pen, did it give you And please, when you add the link in, don't type it manually. Visit the website and 
copy the link from the browser window because sometimes it's got HTTP, sometimes it's HTTPS, sometimes it has W, sometimes it doesn't. So always visit the website, copy <coughs> the URL, and then paste it in to that spot. Okay. So that's contact info. Um, if you've got a link on, if you've done a PhD and it's on uh, a research website, you can link to that. Also, if you uh, are not just an engineer, you do something else, you can look up the My Future website and if you're in a different profession, they've got associations that you can consider joining that are related to that profession as well. your experience section and again because I'm a consultant it's probably different to a lot of you but I haven't just given myself the job title of independent LinkedIn specialist I've added in more keywords after my job title so don't just say engineer you know going into all the other words that would be related to it that the recruiter might be looking for if they were looking for your skills and I obviously talk about how I can help you with that one because that's the type of work I'm looking for but here in the job, I start off with achievements and then tasks, and then I describe the business and link to contact details. So that's the way I do it for a traditional job. So feel free to check out my profile and see it at any stage. And then it's all the other sections after that. So education, skills, you know, the text in the experience, the text in the summary, it's all those other spots. But those three are the, really the most important. Yeah. And obviously, if you have certain skills mentioned and other people with those same skills have endorsed you, that's better value. So if I said you're a good engineer, you know, I can't because I don't know, but say I I met you and I thought you were a good engineer, because I'm not an engineer, that's not going to be of much value to you. But if another engineer did that, we do. Mm. Okay. Uh, yeah, ask them. <laughs> or cross your fingers and hope, you know. <laughs> like, I, I don't chase endorsements, I really don't. But because I'm online occasionally, some nice people do it, even if they haven't met me, so. I feel reluctant to do that sort of thing unless I really know somebody and a lot of the time I don't meet them for long enough to be able to do that. So I don't do it like that. Um, okay, so that's experience and now education. Now we're all alumni of Monash and I'm a very proud alumni of the University of South Australia. They even come to Melbourne to run events, it's very exciting. <coughs> um, so obviously, I want to promote the university where I got my qualification <coughs> from. Some of you have got multiple universities. Now, going back to my daughter's story, she did three subjects at Monash before she went to La Trobe University. And she was concerned about whether or not she should put that on her LinkedIn profile, because she said, oh, well, mum, I didn't finish, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I said, no, you must add it to your LinkedIn profile, because then you will come up under alumni searches for Monash, as well as alumni searches for La Trobe University. So even if you've only done a subject somewhere, please add it in to your education section. And all you can say is in the details, completed XYZ subject. Doesn't, you don't have to say you did a bachelor's, you just say you completed X subject. That's perfectly fine. Now, because in Melbourne nobody's even heard of the University of South Australia, I give a brief description about the university, and then I've written up all my subjects and you can see that nobody had to click to see all my subjects. And I specifically chose that degree as a mature age student at the age of 26, because for me it was like a baby MBA, lots of different subjects. So I'm very happy to disclose those subjects. Now say for instance, I wanted to be a non-executive director or a board member. What I would need to have is specific skills and they include governance, risk, and compliance, GRC. A lot of directors, that's what they have to know about. So one of the subjects I did was called 
business ethics. And in that subject, we did talk about governance, risk and compliance. So if I wanted to play the algorithm game, I could say my subjects included, da, 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 and I could say my topics included, governance, risk and compliance, and nobody would know that, you know, because it's the algorithms and the search query that finds me first. It's not, you know, the screen. So whilst we're still smarter than the robots, use it to our advantage and tell the story that you need to tell. So if your university subjects didn't match the work you're looking for, but the topics within those subjects matched, you might like to include topics in that section. And I guarantee you, probably 90 out of 100 LinkedIn profiles you look at will not have data in that box. They'll just say they've got an engineering degree. They won't mention anything else about it. And they're losing such a great opportunity because it's keywords that people can find you for. Make sense? And then I've also said that I completed it by correspondence and it was conferred and there's the website. Now you might think, why on earth do you have to write all that in? Well, I don't. But do you believe I got the degree? It seems pretty obvious. And if you don't, you can contact them. And you can say, did she can get this qualification on such and such a date? So it's all there as sort of evidence of, and you know, social proof that I've actually done these things. And then I've even drug out a video from YouTube about the university just to make it look sexy on there. Also done other courses. I'm a professional member of all these bodies, so therefore I've added them in the license and certification section. So if you're a member of Engineers Australia, you can again put that in that spot. In the licenses and certifications. Because to be a professional member of Engineers Australia, you have to meet requirements. So I classify that as a certification. So not just electricians and plumbers and so on, but anybody who's a professional member can list their membership in the professional membership and certifications. Uh, sorry, Emma, I have worked for a few years and then I did not switch to here. In my LinkedIn profile, I have boots with that uni experience. In that experience part, right. yes. uh, they might have, like, for example, research engineer, and I put all the skills and Terrific. data that's done, but is that a product thing? Yes, absolutely. You can put it in both. So you could put it in the experience section so it doesn't look like you're in jail for that period. Four years, yeah. Gee, went away for a long time, didn't you? What was your crime? Um, but yes, also in the, in the education section. So you can put it in both. Now, one of the things I've done is I've had a voluntary role for the Australian Human Resources Institute. Now, while I was in that voluntary role, I put it in my experience section because it was related to my career as well as my voluntary experience section. Now that I'm not in that capacity in trying to push HR, I've taken it out of the experience section and just left it in my voluntary experience section. Okay, so if, like, I used to work with international students during my studies, mm -hmm. but as you say, this is not related to my career. So can I, if I have But it was voluntary? It was actually part of it was voluntary, part of it well, you can put both in, you can put, add it in both sections. Yeah, because the algorithms are looking at all the fields and the algorithms love seeing voluntary experience because as employers, we love the fact that people are making an extra contribution. And so when I was doing the graduate recruitment for Westpac, we would actually, we did not like students who only went to uni. We like students who played sport and who had a part-time job and went to uni and were, got some scouting thing or, you know, whatever, something else. Um, and even if they only got C's instead of A's, you know, like it didn't matter because it showed that they were work capable. Because just because you've been to uni doesn't mean you're work capable. They talk about being work ready I still don't even think they're work ready. So we had this philosophy in the bank. It took us six months to get them out of university mode and be able to be bankers. 
Um, so anything that can demonstrate your work capability and your transferable skills, put it in. Because you worked with international students, that meant you had cross-cultural competence. You know, so we can infer these things, or you can mention these things. Developed cross-cultural competencies, working with students from up to 60 countries, or you know, whatever. You could indicate that as, as a skill. So then if you're doing a multicultural workforce in Australia, we know that you can already adjust to the needs of different, you know, cultural backgrounds. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so voluntary experience. So what I used to do is I used to go and speak at Rotary groups and they're full of a lot of old men, unfortunately, here in Melbourne. And every time I went there, they told me, we don't need a LinkedIn profile, we're retired. So I thought, you know what, I'm sick of preaching to the unconvertible. There's no point wasting my time talking to these people anymore. So I decided I'd volunteer and answer questions on Cora.com where I would be appreciated and I might also get some search results, which has worked for me. So I get a lot of people viewing my answers all the time on Cora.com. But the next one you can see is my voluntary role at ARI. It's not my role at scout camps. So I volunteer care of dogs and cats. I mean, that's not really going to help me with the internet. So further down, you'll see I did a bit of work at <coughs> church, I did work for the school, you know, all these others. But they're much further down because they're not as important to the skills I offer to people now. And so I use the little hamburger on the side. So you, when you see a little hamburger like that, you can shuffle the order and change the order around. So the thing that's most relevant can go towards the top. Um, yeah, so there's plenty of other bits and pieces you can fill in. So, job search. Under this jobs tab, you can turn off career interests. And I really encourage you to do this. I'm, I said I'm occasionally looking, even if you're not looking, but you want to come up in search results for other locations. So say you're a business and you want to get work from Sydney or Singapore or, you know, Saigon, who cares? What you can do is you can add in locations and you can say, I want to be found in search results for these other locations. So you might say, I want to have a gap here in London. So, you know, add London to your, to your thing. And then you can fill all that in and obviously give a note to recruiters so if the recruiter looks at your profile, they know where you're at. Um, there's some other instructions there about following companies and setting hashtags and doing research. So if you look for a lot of people on LinkedIn and you run out of searches, you can use a Google advanced search. Now, another thing I did is I've written articles on LinkedIn. So over here, Here's your news feed, so you can put something in the news feed or you can write an article. So one of the articles I've written is Tough Love for the Unemployed. And I've written three, one for over 50s, one for under 30s, and one for 30s to 50s. And the one that's for the under 30 seems to be the most popular, and that's still in search results. But if you click on that one, it will show you the links to the others. Um, and that was an article I wrote on LinkedIn that I optimised in search, and so now it appears in Google search results. So if you've got really important topics you want to talk about, and you search engine optimise your articles, you too can have them appearing in search results. I've also got another article that I've written on the bottom of page nine about job search strategies that will work. And then on page 10, I talk about having a company. So. If you've got your own business, it explains there how to create a company and then how to maximise it and how to get your employees to support your business. So if you're working for a company, I really encourage you to read that one about ways employees can support a business. Because we should all be very thankful to our employers for giving us a job. And I believe we should support them. So that explains some ways that if you're in a job, you can support the business that you're working for. And I highly, highly recommend that you follow Monash University, Monash Talent, Monash Engineering Student Society, and perhaps if you're a member of the Golden Key International Honour Society. And there's also a Monash person that I think Sonia manages, 
and she would love you to connect with her. So please connect with that person on LinkedIn. It's actually against the LinkedIn user agreement to have that person, so we're just keeping our fingers crossed we don't lose the connection, um, but definitely will help you stay in touch with the engineering alumni if you're uh, connected to that person on LinkedIn. Have you got the LinkedIn app on your phone tonight? You might be able to connect when we do the find nearby if you're signed into that account. Yeah. Um, there's also a really great link to the e-safety commissioner. So if any of you are in workplaces where there are children around, it's a good idea to follow that checklist to make sure you're safe online. Groups are an option on LinkedIn and there are a number of Monash groups that you can join. As a general rule, I don't recommend groups because they're usually full of a lot of people just flogging their own stuff. But university groups are a different kettle of fish, so please consider joining those LinkedIn groups. Also, if you're going to be on social media, LinkedIn or others, I strongly recommend that you only use images that either you have taken or got written permission to use. And so that's why if you ever see any of my writing, I've usually got pictures of beaches and trees and, and plants or something, they can't sue me for taking their photo, you know, because people will find images and tell you you're not allowed to use it. So please make sure you've used images that you're allowed to use. And video can be extra helpful. So a lot of people like watching videos, but if you're gonna use videos on LinkedIn, I suggest you keep them under a minute. And if you can, upload them to YouTube first, so you can get the little captions <coughs> file, and then you download that captions file. And then when you upload the video into LinkedIn, you can upload the captions, and then people can see the captions even if they don't have their sound. Um, as I said earlier, Google wants you to have more than just a website, it wants you to have social media as well. So there's some stats on which social media platforms you might like to be interested in. For example, although LinkedIn has five and a half million active monthly users, Instagram has nine million. YouTube and Facebook have 15 million active monthly users. So if you're in business, you would definitely want to be considering some of these other platforms to share your message. Um, and Census, which is the old Yellow Pages phone book, they have an amazing social media report. It's very lengthy, but again, if you're in business, really, really worthwhile having a look at. Also, if any of you are producing content that is online, I really, really encourage you to have an Excel spreadsheet with all of your content and where you had it published on LinkedIn, <coughs> did you tell Google, did you?